Hello, this is Christopher from Defeat Modernism, and welcome to the final part of St. John Yude on the Sacred Heart of Jesus. For those of you who are just catching this for the first time, I will put a link to part one in the description box of the video. Uh, this particular video will cover the meditations, the prayers for the vigil of the Feast of the Sacred Heart, as well as for the feast itself. And I don't know about you, but for me, having doing these readings each day, making these videos, it kind of felt like this week was almost uh, another holy week. So I just would be curious what some of you think. Uh, please comment in the video or on the podcast. I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are, your feelings on it, those of you who have been uh, following each of these videos this whole week as well. But with that, let's get straight into the, the meditations. This first meditation will be for the vigil of the feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And we'll ask Our Lady, Mother of the Sacred Heart, to pray and intercede for us and help us enter into these meditations as we pray. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. The first disposition for the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus is a burning desire to celebrate it devoutly. Consider that the adorable heart of Jesus is the principle and source of his incarnation, birth, circumcision, presentation in the temple, and of all the other mysteries and states of his life, as well as of all his thoughts, words, deeds, and sufferings for our salvation. His heart, burning with love, prompted him to perform all these things for us. Thus, it is that we owe honor and love to this most amiable heart for countless reasons, and to show our affection, we must celebrate this feast with all possible devotion. Let us offer our hearts to the Holy Ghost and earnestly beg him to enkindle us with a burning desire to celebrate the Feast of the Sacred Heart with as much devotion as though we were to celebrate it only once on earth. This great desire constitutes the first requisite in preparation for the solemn feast. Second point. The second disposition is humility. The second disposition is one of deep humility. We must acknowledge our infinite unworthiness to take any part in the celebration of such a holy solemnity. Number one, because it belongs to heaven rather than to earth. And because the feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus is a feast of the seraphim rather than of sinful men. Number two, because through our negligence, God's blessings have not borne the fruit they should have in our souls, although we have celebrated this feast many times. The divine heart is the source of every grace that we have received from heaven throughout our lives. Yet our ingratitude and faithlessness have rendered these precious gifts fruitless and ineffectual. May these thoughts inspire us to profound humility. Let us enter again and again into a true spirit of penance, which will prompt us to detest our sins, to excite genuine contrition in our souls, and to make a good confession to purify our hearts, so that we may become worthy recipients of the light and grace necessary for a holy celebration of this feast. Third point. The third disposition is union with the three divine persons of the Blessed Trinity, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the angels and saints. As the third disposition, we must offer ourselves to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, to the Blessed Virgin Mary, to all the angels and saints, especially to our guardian angels and our patron saints. We must implore them to prepare our hearts and to invite the heavenly court to celebrate this feast with us. Let us ask them to make us their associates and sharers in their ardent love for the most adorable heart of Jesus. Prayer Thanks be to thee, Lord Jesus, for the ineffable gift of thy sacred heart. Second Meditation The Day of the Feast The Gift of the Sacred Heart of Jesus to Us First Point Jesus has given us his sacred heart. Adore and consider our most lovable Savior, in the excess of his goodness, 
and in the generosity of his love towards us. Consider attentively his boundless beneficence. He has given us life and all the benefits that spring from the gift of life. He has given us his eternal father to be our true father, his most holy mother to be our dear mother, his angels to be our protectors, and his saints to be our advocates and intercessors. He has given us his church, our second mother, together with all the sacraments of his church for our salvation and sanctification. He has given us all his thoughts, words, actions, and mysteries, all his sufferings, and his very life, which he spent and sacrificed for us, even to the last drop of his precious blood. Moreover, he has given us his most lovable heart, the principle and source of all other gifts. The charity of his divine heart impelled him to emanate from the adorable bosom of his Father and come upon earth so that he might give us all these priceless favors. This heart, humanly divine and divinely human, merited these graces by his sufferings endured for us on earth. Second point, we should give our hearts to Jesus. How shall we repay our loving Redeemer for so much love? We must render love for love. In return for the gift of his sacred heart, we must give him our hearts without reserve. To return our Lord love for love, we must offer our love wholly and completely to him. He has given us his heart for all eternity. We must give him ours forever. He has given us his heart with infinite love. Let us give him ours in union with his infinite love. He is not satisfied with giving us his own heart. He has also given us the heart of his eternal Father, the heart of his most holy Mother, and the hearts of all his angels and saints. He even gives the hearts of all mankind who are commanded under pain of eternal damnation to love us as he has loved us. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Let us also offer him in thanksgiving the heart of his eternal Father, the heart of his holy Mother, the hearts of all the angels and saints and of all men. These are ours to give as though they belong to us. St. Paul assures us that with the gift of his Son, the Eternal Father has given us all things. Omnis cum ipso nobis donavit. He that spared not even his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. How hath he not also, with him, given us all things? But above all, let us offer him his own heart. He has given it to us, therefore it is ours and is the most acceptable offering we could make to him. It is his own heart, and at the same time, the heart of his eternal Father, one by unity of essence. It is also the heart of his most holy mother, whose heart is one with his by unity of will and affection. Prayer Let us give thanks to the sacred heart of Jesus for his ineffable gifts. Third Meditation The gift of this feast is a great favor from our Lord. First point. Excellence of the Feast of the Sacred Heart. Let us adore the incomprehensible goodness of our most loving Redeemer in giving us this holy feast. It is indeed an extraordinary grace. To understand it at all adequately, we must remember that the feasts celebrated by Holy Church during the course of the year are fountains of sanctification and blessings. But this feast is a veritable sea of grace and holiness. The feast of the most sacred heart of Jesus constitutes an immense ocean of feasts because it commemorates the principle of all the other feasts celebrated by Holy Church. It also is the festival of the prime source of everything that is great, holy, and venerable in each of the other feasts. It is our duty, then, to render infinite thanks to our Savior for his goodness and to invite the Blessed Virgin all the angels and saints, and all creatures, to unite with us to praise, bless, and glorify him for this ineffable favor. We should also dispose our souls to receive the graces he wills to to communicate to us during the solemnity of this wonderful feast. We must make a strong resolution to do everything in our power and to employ all our affections and every means possible to continue to celebrate it appropriately and devoutly during the octave. Second point, our duties to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Why has the King of all hearts given us this feast of his most lovable heart? Solely that we may perform our duties to him. We have four principal duties to fulfill. 
The first duty is adoration. Let us adore the heart of Jesus with all our heart and all our strength. It is infinitely worthy of adoration because it is the heart of God, the heart of the only begotten Son of the Eternal Father and of God made man. Let us adore this precious heart, offering it all the adoration ever accorded to it in heaven and on earth. O my Savior, may the whole universe unite in adoration of thy divine heart. I willingly consent to be reduced to nothingness now and forever by means of thy grace, so that the sacred heart of Jesus may be incessantly adored by the whole universe. Our second duty is to praise, bless, glorify, and thank his infinitely generous heart for its tremendous love for the Eternal Father, his Most Holy Mother, all the angels, all the saints, and all creatures, especially ourselves. Let us also thank him for all the gifts, favors, and blessings poured out from this immense sea of graces upon all things created, particularly upon us. O most sublime heart, I offer thee all the praise, glory, and thanksgiving rendered thee in heaven and on earth, in time and eternity. May all hearts praise and bless thee forever. The third duty is to ask pardon of his kind heart for all the sorrow and suffering endured for our sins and to offer in reparation all the satisfaction and joys given to our Lord by his eternal Father, by his blessed Mother, and by all ardent and faithful hearts. Let us accept out of love for the Sacred Heart all the trials, sorrow, and affliction which may come upon us. The fourth duty is to love this Divine Heart with all possible affection and fervor in the name of those who do not love it, and to offer it the entire love of all hearts that belong to it. O heart all-lovable and all-loving, when shall I begin to love thee as I should? I am under countless obligations to love thee, yet, alas, I realize that I have not even commenced. Grant me the grace to begin straightway to love thee. Destroy in my heart whatever is displeasing to thee, and establish instead the reign of thy holy love. Prayer God of my heart, my portion, Jesus, forever. Fourth Meditation The Sacred Heart of Jesus is our refuge, our oracle, and our treasure. First Point The Sacred Heart of Jesus is our refuge. In the feast we are celebrating, our most loving Savior has given us His heart, not only as the object of our homage and adoration, but also as our refuge and our shelter. Let us resort to this haven in all our undertakings and seek therein our consolation in our sorrows and afflictions. Let us place ourselves in the shadow of its protection against the malice of the world, against our own passions and the snares of the devil. Let us retire to this shelter of goodness and mercy to shield ourselves from all the perils and miseries of life. Let us seek refuge in the Sacred Heart, in the Tower of Strength, where we may escape the vengeance of divine justice for our sins, which cause the death of the very author of life. May this most benign and generous heart be our shelter and our refuge in all our necessities. Second point. The Sacred Heart of Jesus is our oracle. Our Divine Lord has given us His heart also to be our oracle. How much more valuable is this gift than the first oracle, which was placed in the tabernacle of Moses, and afterwards in the Temple of Solomon. The first oracle was confined to one place, but ours is to be found wherever our Savior is present. The former was in existence but a few centuries. Ours will last until the end of time. The oracle of the old law spoke by the voice of an angel, but the oracle of the new law is the very voice of Christ himself. O Jesus, Thou dost speak heart to heart, teaching us thy will, resolving our doubts, smoothing our difficulties when we have recourse to thy sacred heart with faith, humility, and confidence. If we wish to know what God asks of us upon different occasions, if we have a difficult task to undertake, if we are in doubt or perplexity, let us have recourse to the heart of our Lord, celebrating Holy Mass in his honor or else receiving Holy Communion. Thus we shall experience the consoling effects of his goodness. 
Third point, the sacred heart of Jesus is our treasure. Our most lovable Redeemer has also given us his most loving heart to be our treasure. It is an immense and inexhaustible treasure, which enriches heaven and earth with infinite blessings. Let us draw from this treasure whatever we need to pay our infinite debts to divine justice for our failings. Let us offer the most sacred heart in satisfaction for our numberless sins, offenses, and negligences. If we lack some virtue, we must draw upon the treasure house of all virtues, the sacred heart of Jesus. If we need humility, let us beg him to impart to us a share of his profound humility. If we need charity, let us implore him by his most ardent charity to give us perfect charity. Likewise, we may take each virtue in turn. When we need a special grace to meet certain circumstances, let us ask our Lord through his most benign heart to grant it to us from our treasure house. If we desire to help the souls in purgatory, let us offer God our precious treasure that he himself may take from it the price due his justice. Meditations When the poor beg for alms, we should ask the Sacred Heart the grace to respond to their appeal and give them a share in our heavenly treasure by saying this prayer. O, O most benign and generous heart of Jesus, have mercy upon all those who suffer. When people ask to be remembered in our prayers, or make any request of us, we should lift up our hearts to Christ, our treasure, saying with true confidence and with deep humility, O loving Savior, arouse in me the feelings of thy charitable heart toward all who come to me for help. The heart of every man is attached to whatever is his treasure. Let us so direct our life that all the affections of our heart may be concentrated on the greatest of all treasures, the most amiable heart of Jesus. Prayer O God of my heart, my love, Jesus forever. Fifth Meditation The Sacred Heart of Jesus is the perfect model and rule of our lives. First Point The Sacred Heart of Jesus is our perfect model. We shall never be able to understand adequately and esteem at its full value the inconceivable grace our Lord has granted us in giving us his divine heart. Let us picture a man who was such a favorite of the king that he could truthfully say, The king's heart belongs to me. What happiness and joy to be so favored! But we have infinitely more than the heart of an earthly king. We have the heart of the king of kings, who loves us so ardently that each one of us can truly say, The heart of Jesus belongs to me. Yes, this admirable heart is mine. It is mine because the Eternal Father has given it to me. It is mine because the Blessed Virgin has given it to me. It is mine because He Himself has given it to me, not only to be my refuge and shelter in my needs, to be my oracle and my treasure, but also to be the model and rule of my life and of my actions. I wish to study this rule constantly, so as to follow it faithfully. I must consider what the heart of Jesus hates and what it loves in order to hate only what it hates and love only what it loves. The only thing it hates or ever shall hate is sin. Did his gentle heart feel any hatred for the miserable Jews who persecuted him so unjustly or for the executioners who treated him so cruelly? No, he never experienced the emotion of hatred. On the contrary, he besought his eternal father to pardon his executioners and even excuse the most outrageous of all crimes. I wish to follow the divine rule for love of thee, my Savior. I will hate nothing but sin. I will love all that thou lovest, even my enemies. With the help of thy grace, I will do all the good I can to those who seek to harm me. Second point. Sentiments that should fill our hearts in imitation of the sacred heart of Jesus. My rule tells me that I must have in my heart what is in the heart of our Lord. For let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. These sentiments are, number one, his affection for the person and will of his eternal Father. 
He so loves his father that he has sacrificed himself and is still prepared to sacrifice himself a hundred thousand times for his glory. His love for the divine will is so great that never once in the course of his life did he prefer his own will, but found his, his entire satisfaction in doing his father's will. Jesus saith to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, that I may perfect his work. Number two. Another sentiment of his heart is horror of sin. He hates evil to such a degree that he delivered himself to the wrath of his enemies and to the torments of the cross to crush the infernal monster. Number three. A third sentiment is his esteem for the cross and for suffering, which he loves so tenderly that the Holy Ghost, speaking of his passion, called it a day of his heart's joy. In the day of the joy of his heart. And that was from the Canticles of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 11. Number 5. There is also a sentiment of charity for us. He so devotedly loves us that it seems, says St. Bonaventure, that he hates himself for us. Number 6. Lastly, there is a sentiment of his heart towards the world. He hates it as something accursed and outcast, openly declaring that it has no part in his prayers. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them whom thou hast given me, because they are thine. And that is from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 17, verse 9. And that his children are not of the world. They are not of the world, as I also am not of the world. And that is from also the Gospel of St. John, chapter 17, verse 16. Such are the divine rules I wish to observe for love of thee, my Savior. I long to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my strength. I long also to find my satisfaction in following in all things and everywhere his most adorable will. I long so to abominate all kinds of sin that by means of thy holy grace I may rather die than ever consent to it. O my Jesus, Make me love crosses and afflictions, that I may seek all my joy in them for the love of thee, and that I may say with St. Paul, I am filled with comfort. I exceedingly abound with joy in all our tribulation. And that is from the second epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 7, verse 4. Make me a sharer in thy very great love for thy holy mother that she after thyself may be the center of my veneration and fervent devotion. Impress upon my heart the hatred thou hast for the world. Make me detested as a veritable antichrist, which is always opposed to thee, and has crucified thee so relentlessly. Grant, I beseech thee, O God of my heart, the grace that for the love of thee I may always preserve in my soul an entire and perfect charity for my neighbor. This is the rule of rules. And whosoever shall follow this rule, peace on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. And that is for the epistle of St. Paul to the Galatians, chapter 6, verse 16. Prayer. O sacred heart of Jesus, law and rule of our heart. Sixth meditation. Jesus has given us his sacred heart to be our heart. First point. The sacred heart of Jesus is given to us to be our heart. The Son of God gives us his heart, not only to be the model and rule of our life, but also to be our heart, so that by the gift of this heart, immense, infinite, and eternal, we may fulfill all our duties to God in a manner worthy of his infinite perfections. We have three obligations in regard to God. Number one, to adore his divine grandeur. Number two, to render him thanks for his unspeakable gifts. Number three, to implore him to grant through his divine generosity all the necessities of soul and body. How are we able to discharge these duties in a manner worthy of God? We are utterly unable to do so. Even if we had the minds, the hearts, and the strength of all angels and men, and if we were to use them to adore, thank, and love God, and to satisfy his divine justice, we could accomplish absolutely nothing to discharge our obligations as creatures of God. We have, however, received from our divine Savior the gift of his adorable heart, which is the perfect means of fulfilling all these duties. 
We should employ the Sacred Heart as if it were our own heart, to adore God fittingly, to love Him perfectly, and to satisfy all our obligations adequately, so that our homage and love may be worthy of His Supreme Majesty. Eternal and infinite thanks be rendered Thee, O good Jesus, for the infinitely precious gift of Thy divine heart. May all the angels and saints and all the creatures bless Thee forever. Second point, how we should make use of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. What happiness and what wealth to possess the Divine Heart of Jesus! What a treasure to have at our disposal! How great is our obligation, O my Savior, because of Thy incomprehensible goodness! Thou dost ask the Eternal Father to make us one with Him and with Thee, as Thou and He are one. Consequently, Thou dost wish to be one in heart with Thee and with Thy adorable Father. Thou hast willed to be our head, and hast willed us to be Thy members, and to have but one heart and one spirit with Thee. Thou hast made us children of Thy heavenly Father. Thou hast given us Thy divine heart, so that we may love the Father with Thy very own heart. Thou hast assured us that the adorable Father loves us even as He loves Thee. I in them, and Thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and the world may know that Thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as Thou hast also loved me. From the Gospel of St. John, chapter 17, verse 23. Thou dost love us with the same heart with which the Father loves Thee. As the Father hath loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. From the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15, verse 9. Thus thou dost give us thy heart, that we may love the Father and thyself with the same heart and with the same love which thou invest us. We should, therefore, employ this, thy sacred heart to offer thee our adoration, praise, thanksgiving, and all our other duties with a reverence and love worthy of thy infinite greatness. What must we do to employ the great heart that God has given us? We must do two things. First, whenever we adore, praise, thank, and love God, or practice some virtue, or accomplish some action for a service, we must renounce our own heart, which is poisoned with the venom of sin and of self-love. Secondly, we must unite ourselves to the love, charity, humility, and all the holy dispositions of a sacred heart, so that we may be worthy to adore, love, praise, serve, and glorify God with the heart of God. O my Savior, extend the power of thy eternal arm to separate me from myself and unite me to thee. Pluck out my miserable heart and replace it with thine own, enabling me to say, I will give praise to thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will praise thee and love thee, my Lord, with my whole heart, with the great heart of Jesus, which is my own heart. O heart all lovable and all loving of my Savior, be thou the heart of my heart, the soul of my soul, the spirit of my spirit, the life of my life, and the sole principle of all my thoughts, words, and actions, of all the faculties of my soul, and of all my senses, both interior and exterior. Prayer. O heart all mine, I possess all things in possessing thee. Seventh Meditation the most profound humility of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. First point, self-abasement of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Humility is a virtue, including an infinity of degrees, because there are innumerable sources of humiliation. There are, however, three principal ones. The first is our nothingness, which is a bottomless abyss of abjection and humiliation. The second is the infinite grandeur of God, for all greatness carries with it loneliness and those who are inferior to it. And the greater the elevation, the greater is the demand of humiliation on the part of the inferior. That is why the supreme greatness of the majesty of God should impress on created beings an abasement infinite in itself. The third principle humiliation is sin. The least of our sins is an infinite abyss of abasement and God could justly annihilate us for our smaller faults. 
Self-abasement is the first effect that humility should produce in our heart. It operated prodigiously in the heart of our divine Savior because Jesus, as man, understood very clearly that he himself was nothing and of himself had only nothingness. Secondly, his very clear perception of the immense grandeur of God held him continually in a state of incomprehensible loneliness. Thirdly, he realized that he was a son of Adam and that original sin is an immense ocean of sin. It is the very fountainhead of all the sins past, present, and future in the whole world, even if it it should last for thousands of years more. Jesus understood that if he had been merely man and had been born of an ordinary earthly mother, and if he had not been preserved at the moment of his conception, he would have been as capable as the other children of Adam of committing all manner of crimes. This held him in a state of profound humiliation. Beyond this, he saw himself charged with all the sins of the world as if they had been his own. Peccata nostra sue esse voluit, says St. Augustine. And he saw himself obliged to bear before God the humiliation of a number of crimes as great as the drops of water and grains of sand in the sea. O Jesus, who could understand all the humiliations thou didst bear on earth to destroy my pride? How is it possible that after all this, my heart can tolerate for one single instant this frightful monster? Second point, hatred of the heart of Jesus for the glory and esteem of the world. To know the second effect of humility in the heart of our Redeemer, let us see his continual hatred for the esteem and glory of this world during the whole course of his life here below. He is the only Son of God and is God equal to his Father. He is the King of glory, the sovereign monarch of heaven and earth, who merits the homage and adoration of all creatures. If he were to display the palace ray of his majesty, the whole universe would fall prostrate at his feet to adore him. But he permits none of his grandeur to appear, either at his birth or in the course of his life, not even after the resurrection, nor in the most adorable sacrament, where he is glorious and immortal. He fled when the Jews wished to make him king, and declared that his kingdom is not of this world. So much did he detest the glory and honors of the world. O Jesus, impress these sentiments upon my heart, and grant that I may learn ever to esteem the praises of the world as poison from hell. Third point, love of the heart of Jesus for humiliation. Recall to your mind all the humiliations All the confusion, contempt, objection, opprobrium, and ignominies that our most adorable Savior bore in his incarnation, in his birth, in his circumcision, in his flight into Egypt, and in all the mysteries of his passion. All these humiliations constitute a magnificent feast that his divine love has prepared. And all the ignominies are as delicious viands upon which he feasted and satisfied his extreme hunger for abasement. Whence did this insatiable hunger proceed, if not from his infinite love for his heavenly Father and for us? This love gave him the incredible desire to be humiliated and considered as nothing, to atone for the infinite injury and inconceivable dishonor the sinner had shown to God. The sinner tears him from his throne so that he may put himself in his Creator's place, preferring his own satisfactions to God's good pleasure, his own honor to that of God, and his own will to the divine will. This injury only a God can perfectly repair by his own abasement. That is why the incomprehensible love of the Son of God for his Father not only obliged him to suffer so many humiliations, but also brought him to the abyss of ignominies to seek his joys and delights to repair more perfectly the dishonor shown to his Father. His love compelled him also to deliver us from the eternal pains of hell, to acquire for us everlasting bliss in heaven, to destroy our pride, the source of all our sins, and to establish in our souls that humility which is the true foundation of all virtues. Infinite thanks, O my Jesus, be to thy holy humility. Everlasting praise to the eternal Father, who exalted thee as highly as thou hast been humiliated, and has given thee a name above all other names. 
May every knee in heaven, on earth, and in hell bend to adore and glorify Jesus Christ. And may every tongue confess my Savior, rejoicing in the immense and eternal glory of his Father. Prayer. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, have mercy on us. Eighth Meditation. The Sacred Heart of Jesus is the King of Martyrs. First point. Sufferings of the Sacred Heart of Jesus because of our sins. All the sufferings of the holy martyrs pale into insignificance in comparison to the infinite sufferings of the adorable heart of the King of Martyrs. If you could number all the sins of the universe, you would count the myriad sharp arrows that pierce the divine heart of our Savior with so many wounds. These wounds caused the Sacred Heart to burn with love for His Eternal Father, whom He saw outraged and dishonored by innumerable crimes. O my Savior, I hate all my sins, because they are the detestable executioners that brought Thy most gentle heart to martyrdom. Again, picture to yourselves a countless number of miserable souls for whom our Savior had an incredible love. He foresaw that, notwithstanding all His sufferings for their salvation, they would by their own fault be lost forever. This vision of the damned inflicted unutterable sorrow on the most charitable heart of Jesus. O unhappy souls, why have you not loved him, who has loved you more than himself, since he has given his very life and blood for your salvation? O dearest Jesus, give me all the hearts of these unfortunate souls, that I may love and praise thee for them eternally. Second point. Sufferings of the Sacred Heart of Jesus because of the trials and torments of the martyrs and Christians. Recall to your minds all the sufferings, the agony, the trials, and the torments of so many millions of martyrs and of all true Christians. All these afflictions are so many bleeding wounds for the most sacred heart of Jesus. His most benign heart could suffer more than the tenderest of hearts because it was filled with an infinite charity for his beloved children. He had before his eyes all their crosses and sufferings. In the hour of affliction, each one saw consolation from his adorable heart. No human mind can understand the agonizing martyrdom suffered by this all-paternal heart in union with his heroic martyrs. This is expressed most remarkably in the words of the prophet Isaiah. Surely he hath borne our infirmities and carried our sorrows. From the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 4. And also in the words of St. Matthew, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. And that comes from the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 8, verse 17. Truly, we can call the sacred heart the king of martyrs and the glory of the cross. How consoling it is for the afflicted to know that all their pain and sorrow have already been suffered by the most benign heart of Jesus. He has borne all sufferings first out of love for his martyrs. Let us give ourselves also to him to bear all our afflictions in union with immeasurable love with which he first suffered them. Third point, sufferings of the sacred heart of Jesus on the cross. All the other sufferings of our Savior seem to diminish when compared to those borne by his divine heart on the cross. The sufferings of Calvary were so excruciating that the perfect body of our Savior was broken with pain and sorrow, and his soul he commended into the hands of his Father. O my Savior, what made thee suffer so many torments, if it was not thy infinite love for thy Father and for us? Indeed, We can say that thou hast died of loving sorrow, and that thy heart has been torn and broken by sorrowing love for the glory of thy Father and for our redemption. O most adorable heart of Jesus, how shall I thank thee for the excess of thy bounty? O, that I could possess all the hearts of heaven and earth to sacrifice them in the flames of thy love. O most holy Father, how canst thou refuse what anyone asks of thee through the amiable heart of thy Son, broken with sorrow for love of thee and for love of us? No, it is impossible. Rather, wouldst thou allow heaven and earth to disappear? It is then, through this divine heart, overcome by love and sorrow for me, that I implore thee, O adorable Father, to take full and entire possession of my heart and to establish there perfectly and forever the reign of the holy love of Jesus and Mary. Prayer. 
Hail, victim of all woes enthroned upon the cross, the martyr's king. Make thou the cross a joy intoned, the crown and glory that we sing. Ave dolorum victima, centrum crucis rex martorum, fac nostra sit crux gloria, amor corona gaudium. Ninth Meditation The Sacred Heart of Jesus is the Heart of Mary. First Point Mutual Love of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary The virginal heart of the Blessed Mother of Jesus has more love for her dear Son than all the angels and saints together. Thus, the Sacred Heart of the Only Son of Mary is so full of love for His Most Loving Mother that He is more to her than all created things together. Let us offer to Jesus the heart and love of His Blessed Mother in reparation for all our want of love and service towards Him. Let us offer to His Most Worthy Mother, who is also our Mother, the heart and love of her Son in satisfaction for our ingratitude and infidelity towards her. Second point. The three divine persons gave the heart of Jesus to Mary, and through her to us. Not only is the Blessed Virgin the first object, after God, of the ardent love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, But the Sacred Heart is really the heart of Mary for five principal reasons. The first three reasons are, one, because the Eternal Father has given her the heart of His only begotten Son as a father gives the heart of a son to his mother. Number two, because the Son has given His most loving heart to the most admirable of mothers. Number three, because the Holy Ghost has given Mary the very spirit of love which unites the Blessed Trinity in the sacred heart of her Son. These three divine persons continually and eternally give Mary the adorable heart of the God-man, so that she may give us her most precious gift, the sacred heart of her divine Son. Incessant and everlasting praise be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost for this infinitely precious gift that they have given to our Blessed Mother and through her to us. O Most Holy Trinity, I offer thee the most adorable heart of Jesus and the most loving heart of his mother in thanksgiving for thy infinite goodness and my regard. I also offer thee, in union with those two most amiable hearts, my own unworthy heart with the hearts of all my brethren, humbly beseeching thee to take full possession of them forever. Third point. Other reasons why the sacred heart of Jesus is the holy heart of Mary. The fourth reason why the Sacred Heart is truly the heart of Mary is that the Eternal Father, having considered the Blessed Virgin from the very instant of her conception as the one chosen to be the Mother of God, gave her from the first moment of her life a love similar to His love for His Divine Son. According to many theologians, Mary had more love for Jesus at that moment than all the seraphim will ever have. Therefore, Mary's incomparable love for Jesus drew him into her sacred womb and into her heart to rest there eternally as the heart of her heart and as a divine sun that sheds its celestial light into her soul and inflames it with divine fire. The fifth reason why the sacred heart of Jesus is the heart of Mary is that at the moment of the incarnation, she cooperated with the Blessed Trinity to form the human heart of Jesus which was formed of her virginal blood. The blood of her holy heart passed into the heart of Jesus and received the perfection that was needed to form the heart of the God-man. This divinely human and humanly divine heart dwelt in the sacred womb of Mary as a furnace of divine love, a furnace which transformed the heart of Mary into the heart of Jesus and made these two hearts but one and the same heart in a unity of spirit, affection, and will. The Holy Heart of Mary was, therefore, always closely united to the Sacred Heart of her Divine Son. She always willed that what He willed, and also consented to act and to suffer so that the work of our salvation might be accomplished. Hence, the Fathers of the Church plainly assert that the Mother of the Savior cooperated with Him in a very special way in the redemption of mankind. That is why our Holy Redeemer told St. Bridget of Sweden, whose revelations have been approved by the Church, that he and his Holy Mother worked in perfect harmony, uno corde, for our salvation. Thus, the Sacred Heart of Jesus is the heart of Mary. These two hearts are but one heart, 
which was given to us by the Blessed Trinity and by our Blessed Mother, so that we, the children of Jesus and Mary, might have but one heart with our Heavenly Father and our Holy Mother, and that we might love and glorify God with the same heart, a heart worthy of the infinite grandeur of His divine majesty. Prayer. O heart of Jesus and Mary, my most loving heart. Eight other meditations on the Sacred Heart of Jesus. First meditation. The Blessed Trinity lives and reigns in the Sacred Heart of Jesus. First point. The Eternal Father lives in the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Consider that the Eternal Father is in the Sacred Heart of Jesus, bringing to birth His well-beloved Son, and causing Him to live there the same all-holy and divine life that He lives in His own adorable bosom from all eternity. He imprints there a perfect image of His own divine fatherhood, so that this humanly divine and divinely human heart shall be father to all the hearts of the children of God. Therefore, we should look upon Him, love and honor Him as our loving Father, and endeavor to imprint upon our own hearts a perfect likeness of His life and virtues. O good Jesus, engrave the image of Thy most holy heart upon our hearts, and make us live only by love for Thy heavenly Father. Would that we might die of love for Thee, as Thou didst die of love for Thy eternal Father. Second point. The divine word lives and reigns in the sacred heart of Jesus. Consider that the eternal word is in that royal heart, united with it in the most intimate union imaginable. The hypostatic union, which causes that heart to be worshipped with the adoration that is due to God. He is there with a life that is somehow more helpful, if one may so speak, than his life in the heart and bosom of his father. The word lives but does not rule in the heart and bosom of the Heavenly Father, whereas he lives and rules in the heart of the God-man, ruling over all human passions, which are centered in the heart, so absolutely that they do not stir except by his order. O Jesus, King of my heart, live and rule over my passions, uniting them with thine, never allowing them to be used except under thy guidance and for thy glory alone. Third point. The Holy Ghost lives and reigns in the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Consider that the Holy Ghost lives and reigns ineffably in the heart of Jesus, where he conceals the infinite treasures of the knowledge and wisdom of God. He fills the Sacred Heart with all his gifts to a preeminent degree, according to his divine words. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of fortitude, the Spirit of knowledge and of godliness. And he shall be filled with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge according to the sight of the eyes, nor approve according to the hearing of the ears. From the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. Consider finally that these three divine persons live and reign in the heart of the Savior, as if they were seated on the most high throne of their love, in the primal heaven of their glory, in the paradise of their dearest delights. They there shed abroad with inexplicable abundance and profusion, wonderful lights, and the burning fires and flames of their eternal love. O most holy Trinity, infinite praise be to thee forever for all the wonders of love that thou dost work in the heart of my Jesus. I offer thee my heart with the hearts of all my brethren, begging thee most humbly to take entire possession of them, to destroy in them everything displeasing to thee, and to establish there the sovereign rule of thy divine love. Prayer, O Most Holy Trinity, eternal life of hearts, reign in all hearts forever. Second Meditation The Sacred Heart of Jesus is the sanctuary and the image of the divine perfections. First Point The divine perfections subsist and reign in the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Let us adore and contemplate all the perfections of the divine nature, subsisting and reigning in the Sacred Heart of Jesus. That is to say, the eternity of God, the infinity of God, his love, charity, justice, mercy, power, immortality, wisdom, goodness, glory, felicity, patience, holiness, and all other perfections. Let us adore these divine perfections and all the wonderful effects they produce in the divine heart of the Son of God. Let us give wholehearted thanks for these manifestations and offer them all the worship, glory, and love 
which have been and shall be rendered to them eternally by that same heart. Second point. The divine perfection stamped their eternal impress on the sacred heart of Jesus. Let us consider that those adorable perfections imprint their image and likeness on the divine heart of our Lord in a manner infinitely more excellent than all human and angelic minds can conceive or express. The adorable heart of Jesus bears within itself the image of eternity by its perfect detachment forever from things fleeting and temporal and by its exceeding great affection for things divine and eternal. It bears the image of immortality by its infinite love for the Heavenly Father and for us, a love whose immensity reaches everywhere, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. If we consider the nature of that incomparable heart, we shall see without difficulty that it bears within itself a living likeness of all the other perfections of the Godhead. O wonderful heart of Jesus, we offer thee our hearts, and press upon them, we beseech thee, some reflection of that divine likeness, so that in us may be accomplished the commandment of our divine master. Be you therefore perfect, as also your heavenly Father is perfect. From the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 48. Third point. The divine mercy should be the object of our very special devotion. Of all the divine perfections mirrored in the sacred heart of our Savior, We should have a very special devotion to divine mercy, and we should endeavor to engrave its image on our heart. To these end, three things must be done. The first is to pardon with all our heart and promptly forget the offenses done us by our neighbor. The second is to have compassion on his bodily sufferings and to relieve and succor him. The third is to compassionate the spiritual misfortunes of our brethren, which are much more deserving of commiseration than the than the corporal ills. For this reason, we ought to have great pity on the numbers of wretched souls who have no pity on themselves, using our prayers, our example, and our teaching to safeguard them from the eternal torments of hell. O most gracious and merciful heart of Jesus, imprint on our hearts a perfect image of thy great perfections, so that we may fulfill the commandment thou hast given us. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. From the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 6, verse 36. Third meditation. The sacred heart of Jesus is the temple, the altar, and the censer of divine love. First point. The sacred heart of Jesus is the temple of divine love. The Holy Ghost, uncreated and eternal, built this magnificent temple and fashioned it of the virginal blood of the mother of love. It is dedicated to eternal love. It is infinitely more sacred, more noble, and more venerable than all the temples, material and spiritual, in heaven and on earth. In this temple, God receives worship, praise, and glory, worthy of his infinite greatness. In this temple, the supreme preacher continually teaches us most eloquently. It is an everlasting temple that shall have no end. It is the center of all holiness, incapable of any profanation. It is adorned with all the Christian virtues in the highest degree and with all the perfections of the divine nature, as with so many living images of the eternal Godhead. Let us rejoice in the vision of all the splendors of this wonderful temple and all the glories there tendered to the divine majesty. Second point, the sacred heart of Jesus, an altar of divine love. The heart of Jesus is not only the temple, but it is also the altar of divine love. On that altar, the sacred flame of omnipotent love burns night and day. On that altar, the great high priest Jesus continually offers to the Most Holy Trinity manifold sacrifices and supreme oblation. First, he offers himself as a sacrifice and victim of love, the most holy and precious victim that ever was or can be. He sacrifices utterly and entirely his body, his blood, his soul, his whole life, all his thoughts, all his words, all his actions, and all that he suffered on earth. Moreover, he makes that sacrifice perpetually with a love that is boundless and infinite. Secondly, he sacrifices everything the Heavenly Father has given him, namely, all rational and irrational creatures, animate and inanimate beings, which he immolates as so many victims in praise of his Father. But, above all, he sacrifices human beings, the good and the wicked, the blessed, and the reprobate. The good he offers as victims of love to his divine goodness. 
the evil he immolates as victims of the wrath of God to his awful justice. Omnis victima salitor. For every one shall be salted with fire, and every victim shall be salted with salt. From the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 9, verse 48. Thus the great high priest sacrifices all things to the glory of his Father on the altar of his heart. Therefore, he alone might rightly say, Letus Aptuli Universa. I have joyfully offered all these things. That is from the first book of Paralipomenon, chapter 29, verse 17. Let us offer ourselves to him and beg him to rank us with the victims of his love, to consume us as holocausts in the divine flames burning incessantly on the altar of a sacred heart. Third point. The sacred heart of Jesus is a censor of divine love. The sacred heart of Jesus is not only the temple and the altar, but also the censor of divine love. It is the golden thurible described in the 8th chapter of the Apocalypse, which St. Augustine interprets as the loving heart of Jesus. In that precious censor, all the worship, praise, prayers, desires, and affections of all the saints are placed like so many grains of incense to be offered to God in the heart of his well-beloved Son ascending as a most pleasing odor to his divine majesty. There we also must place all our prayers, all our desires, all our devotions, and all the pious affections of our hearts. Yes, our very hearts themselves, with all that we do and all that we are, beseeching the king of all hearts to purify and sanctify all these things, and to offer them to his Father as a heavenly incense of sweet fragrance. Thus, the sacred heart of our Jesus is the temple, the altar, the censer, the priest, the victim of divine love, all for our sake, performing on our behalf the functions of those divine offices. O love so abundant, O my Savior, how wonderful are thy loving kindnesses! Ah, what reverence and praise I should give to thy loving heart in return! O most blessed heart of Jesus, let me be not but heart and love towards thee, and let all hearts on heaven and earth be immolated to thy praise and glory. Prayer. Hail, priest of hearts and victim, hail. Alone thou equal art to God, most worthy temple, holy grail, and altar holiest laud. Fourth meditation. The sacred heart of Jesus loves us with an everlasting and a boundless love. First point. The sacred heart of Jesus loves us with an everlasting love. The divine heart of our Savior is filled with eternal love for us. To realize this truth, one should understand two things about eternity. First, that it has neither beginning nor end. Secondly, that it compromises in itself all ages, past, present, and future, all years, months, weeks, days, hours, and moments of the past, present, and future, and that it compromises them in a fixed and permanent manner holding all those things united and joined together in one indivisible point. That is how eternity differs from time. Time runs on incessantly. As one moment arrives, another elapses and is left behind. And so one never sees two moments of time together. But in eternity, everything is permanent. Whatever is eternal always remains of the same extension. That is why the eternal love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus for us compromises two elements. First, this incomparable heart has loved us from all eternity, before we were and could have known and loved it, even in spite of the vision and knowledge that it had of all our offenses which were present to its vision as they are now. Secondly, the amiable heart of Jesus loves us at every moment with all the love wherewith it has ever loved us and shall love us throughout all eternity. Thus, we can see the difference between God's love and ours. Our love is a passing act. The love of God is constant. The love that God has exercised towards us for a hundred thousand years remains in his heart together with that which he will dispense a hundred thousand years from now. Eternity implies that in God there is nothing past nor future, but all is present, so that God loves us now with all the love wherewith he has loved us from all eternity, and wherewith he will love us forever. O eternity of love, O eternal love, if I had existed from all eternity, I should have been bound to love thee from all eternity, and yet, my God, I have not begun to love thee as I should. 
But at least let me begin now, O my Savior, to love thee as thou wouldst be loved. O God of my heart, I give myself to thee to be united to thy ceaseless love for me from all eternity. I surrender myself to thee, to be united to the love wherewith thou lovest thy Father before all centuries, so as to love the Father and the Son with an eternal love. Second point. The Sacred Heart of Jesus loves us with a boundless love. The loving heart of Jesus loves us with a boundless love. The divine and uncreated love which possesses that adorable heart is nothing else but God himself. Now, since God is unlimited, his love is also unlimited. Since God is everywhere, his love is everywhere, in all places and in all things. Therefore, the sacred heart of Jesus loves us not only in heaven, but he also loves us on earth. He loves us in the sun, in the stars, and in all created things. He loves us in the hearts of all the denizens of heaven and in the hearts of all persons that have some measure of charity for us on earth. All love for ourselves existing in the hearts in heaven and on earth is a participation in the love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Moreover, He loves us even in the hearts of our enemies, despite the hatred they bear us. I even make bold to say that He loves us in hell, in the hearts of the devils and the damned, in spite of all their wrath and hatred, since the divine love is everywhere, filling heaven and earth like the presence of God. O boundless love, I plunge myself into thy fires and flames that fill all created beings, in order to love my God and my Savior in all places and in all things. O Jesus, I offer thee all the boundless love of thy heart, of the adorable heart of thy divine Father, the lovable heart of thy Holy Mother, and of all the hearts that love thee in heaven and on earth. I ardently desire that all creatures of the universe be transformed into flaming fires of love towards thee. Prayer How late have I loved thee, O goodness so ancient, and yet so new! How late have I loved thee! Fifth Meditation The Sacred Heart of Jesus is the source of the life of the God-man, of the Mother of God, and of the children of God. First Point The Sacred Heart of Jesus is the source of the life of the God-man. The adorable heart of our Savior is the source of the life of the God-man and consequently is the source of all the thoughts and feelings of the Son of God on earth, of all the words he pronounced, of all the actions he performed, of all the sufferings he endured, and of the incomprehensible love wherewith he did and suffered all things for our salvation. Therefore, it is to thy loving heart, O my Jesus, that our obligation is due. What shall we do to thank thee? We can do nothing more pleasing to thee than to offer thee thy most divine heart. I offer it then to thee, my Savior, in union with the infinite love wherewith it hath accomplished so many wonderful things for our redemption. Second point. The Sacred Heart of Jesus is the source of the life of the Mother of God. The Sacred Heart of Jesus is the source of the life of Mary, the Mother of God. When that admirable mother was carrying her beloved son in her blessed womb, Her virginal heart was the source of the natural bodily life of her divine child. But the heart of that adorable child was, at the same time, the source of the spiritual and supernatural life of his most worthy mother. Hence, the divine heart of the only son of Mary was the source of all the pious thoughts and feelings of his blessed mother, of all the sacred words she spoke, of all the good deeds she performed, of all the virtues she practiced, and of all the pains and sorrows she suffered in order to cooperate with her beloved Son in the work of our salvation. Praise eternal, O my Jesus, to thy divine heart. O my Redeemer, in thanksgiving for the great wonders of grace that thy filial heart hath wrought in thy glorious mother, I offer her maternal heart flaming with love for thee. Third point. The Sacred Heart of Jesus is the source of life of the children of God. The Sacred Heart of Jesus is the source of life of all the children of God. Since it is the source of the life of the head, it is also the source of the life of the members. And since it is the source of life of the father and the mother, it is the source of life of the children. That is why we should regard and honor that benign heart as the source and origin of all the good thoughts in the minds of all Christians, of all the holy words that have issued from their lips, of all the virtues that they have practiced, and of all the toil they have borne for their sanctification as Christians. O my Savior, may all these things be transmuted into immortal praise to thy most sacred heart. 
O Jesus, since thou hast given me that very heart to be the source of my life, let it be, I beseech thee, the sole source of all my feelings and affections, of all the faculties and functions of my soul, and of all the use I make of my interior and exterior senses. In fine, let it be the soul of my soul, the spirit of my spirit, and the heart of my heart. Prayer. O heart of Jesus, principle of all good, to thee be praise and glory forever. Sixth Meditation. The three hearts of Jesus, which are but one heart. First point. The divine heart of Jesus. We have three hearts to adore in our Savior, which nevertheless are but one single heart by virtue of the hypostatic union. The first is his divine heart existing from all eternity in the bosom of his adorable Father, which is but one heart and one love with the love and heart of his Father, and which, with the heart and love of his Father, is the source of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when he gave us his heart, he also gave us the heart of his Father and of his adorable Spirit. Hence, his marvelous words, I love you with the same heart and the same love wherewith I love my Father. My Father loves me with an eternal, boundless, and infinite love. I love you also with a love that is eternal, boundless, and infinite. My Father causes me to be what I am, God like to himself, an only Son of God, and I make you to be by grace and participation what I am by nature and essence, that is to say, God's and children of God, seeing that you have but one and the same Father as I, a Father who loves you with the same heart and the same love wherewith he loves me, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast also loved me. From the Gospel of St. John, chapter 17, verse 23. My eternal Father has constituted me universal heir of all his goods, and I make you my co-heirs. I promise to give you possession of all my treasures. My Father finds all his pleasure and delight in me, and I take my delight and pleasure in you. O goodness, O love, O God of love, how is it possible for the hearts of men to be so hard and cold towards thee, who art all aflame with the fire of love towards them? O let all my joy and delight be in thinking of thee, in speaking of thee, in serving and loving thee. O my all, let me be wholly thine, and do thou alone possess all that is in me. Second point, the spiritual heart of Jesus. The second heart of Jesus is his spiritual heart, which is the will of his holy soul, a purely spiritual faculty, whose function is to love what is lovable and to hate what is hateful. But the divine Savior so perfectly sacrificed his human will to his divine Father that he never exercised it while on earth and will never exercise it even in heaven, but he sought uniquely and solely his Father's will, according to those words of his. I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now, It is out of love for us that our Lord renounced his own will in order to perform the work of our salvation solely by the will of his Father, in particular when he prayed to him in the Garden of Olives. Father, not my will, but thine be done. O God of my heart, if for love of me thou didst sacrifice thy utterly holy and divine will, how much more should I renounce my own will for love of thee, wholly depraved and corrupted as it is by sin? Ah, let me renounce it with all my heart forever, imploring thee most humbly, O my adorable Redeemer, to crush it like a serpent full of venom and to establish in its place the rule of thy divine will. Third point, the corporeal heart of Jesus. The third heart of Jesus is the sacred heart of his deified body, a furnace of love divine and of incomparable love for us. Since the corporeal heart is hypostatically united to the person of the word, It is enkindled with flames of infinite love for us. Its love is so intense that it constrains the Son of God to bear us continually in his heart, to fix his eyes ever upon us, to take such a great interest in the smallest things concerning us that he verily numbers all the hairs of our head, allowing not one of them to perish. To ask his Father that we might make our eternal abode within his bosom. Father, I will that where I am, 
they also whom thou hast given me may be with me, that they may see my glory which thou hast given me, because thou hast loved me before the creation of the world. From the Gospel of St. John, chapter 17, verse 24. And to assure us that if we vanquish the enemies of his glory and of our salvation, he will make us sit with him on his own throne and will let us enter into possession of the same kingdom and the same glory that his eternal father has given him. Oh, how abundant and rapturous is the love of Jesus for such faithless and ungrateful men as we. Oh, Jesus, my love, either take away my life or let me live only to love thee, to praise and glorify thee unceasingly. Let me die a a thousand deaths, rather than willingly do anything to grieve thee. Thou hast three hearts, which are but one and the same heart, a heart wholly devoted to loving me continually. Would that I possessed all the hearts in the universe, that I might consume them in thy holy love. Prayer. I love thee, O most loving Jesus. I love thee, O infinite goodness. I love thee with my whole heart, and I wish to love thee more and more. Seventh Meditation the miracles of the sacred heart of Jesus. First point. Miracles of the sacred heart of Jesus in the realm of nature. Set before your eyes the realm of nature, the great universe comprising so many wonderful things, namely the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars and comets, the four elements of which the air is peopled by such a great variety of birds, the earth replete with its marvelous abundance of animals, trees, plants, flowers, fruits, metals, stones, the sea, filled with such prodigious multitude of fishes. Add to that the creatures of reason, men and angels. Consider them in the natural state of their creation. What a miracle to have made this amazing universe out of nothing. It is not a miracle, it is a world of miracles without number. Count all the creatures made by God, and you will count so many miracles that God has performed in drawing them from the abyss of nothingness. Number all the moments that have elapsed since the creation of the world, and you will number so many miracles since preservation is a continuous creation. There is also an infinite number of other wonders perpetually wrought in the governance of this universe. Now, who is the author of those innumerable miracles? It is the inconceivable goodness and the incomprehensible love of the divine heart of that adorable word mentioned by St. John the Evangelist in the first words of his gospel. Omnia per ipsum facta sunt. All things were made by him. It is because of his love for us that he has made all things, even though he had always before his eyes the ingratitudes, the offenses, and the crimes without limit which he was obliged to suffer and still endures every day from us. That is why all those things which he created are so many tongues and voices preaching to us unceasingly the ineffable charity of his most gracious heart and exhorting us to adore him, to love him, and to glorify him in every possible manner. Heaven and earth, says St. Augustine, and all things contained therein, cease not to tell me that I should love my God. Celum et terra et omnia quae in eis sunt, non cesant mihi decere ut amem Deus meum. Second point. Miracles of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in the Realm of Grace. Picture the realm of grace, which compromises an infinitude of wonders, incomparably surpassing those of the world of nature. It contains all the miracles of sanctity that have been wrought on the earth by the Holy of Holies, all the wonders that transpired in the Mother of Grace, the entire church militant, all the sacraments, with all the marvelous effects which they produce, all the wonderful things that divine grace has effected and will effect in the lives of all the saints that have been and that shall be in this world. What is the source of all those wonders? Is it not the inconceivable charity of the blessed heart of our Redeemer, who has established and, co- and constantly preserves this amazing world of grace on earth for love of us? O my Jesus, let all these wonders of thy most loving heart and all the powers of thy divinity and thy humanity be employed to bless thee and praise thee unceasingly and eternally. O all ye powers of the Lord, bless the Lord. Third point. Miracles of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in the Realm of Glory Raise your mind and your heart to heaven to contemplate the realm of glory, the fair, great, and glorious city of heaven, 
of which all the citizens are forever freed from all kinds of tribulations and showered with countless blessings. Behold that innumerable army of the blessed. After this I saw a great multitude which no man could number, who are more dazzling than the sun, who possess incalculable riches, joys, unspeakable, and glories indescribable. Consider the inconceivable happiness which awaits you in that heavenly Jerusalem, since the Holy Ghost declares that never has eyes seen, nor ear heard, nor human heart understood, nor can ever understand the infinite treasures that God has prepared there for them that love him. Now, what has made heaven, and who is the author of all the miracles contained therein? It is the intense love of the Sacred Heart of the Son of God, who has merited it by his blood, who has filled it with an ocean of unutterable delights, to give us the full and perfect possession of it eternally. O my Savior, graciously let me offer thee, I beg thee, as an act of thanksgiving, all the glories and wonders of paradise. If I were possessed of a hundred thousand paradises, how gladly would I, by the help of thy grace, divest myself of them, so as to sacrifice them to thy eternal praise. Prayer. Let the mercies of the Lord give glory to him, and his wonderful works to the children of man. Eighth Meditation The Sacred Heart of Jesus is a furnace of love, purifying, illuminating, sanctifying, transforming, and deifying. First point, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a furnace of love for us. The most loving heart of our benign Savior is a burning furnace of most pure love for us. A furnace of purifying love, of illuminating love, of sanctifying love, of transforming love, and of deifying love. His love is a purifying love in which the hearts of holy souls are purified more perfectly than gold in the furnace. An illuminating love which scatters the darkness of hell with which the earth is covered and lets us into the wonderful brilliance of heaven who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. A sanctifying love which destroys sin in our souls in order to establish that of the kingdom of grace. A transforming love which transforms serpents into doves, wolves into lambs, beasts into angels, children of the devil into children of God, children of wrath and malediction into children of grace and blessing. A deifying love which makes gods of men. Ego dixi dii estis. Letting them share in the holiness of God, his mercy, his patience, his goodness, his love, his charity, and his other divine perfections. Divine consortes nature. O divine love of my Jesus, I give myself wholly to thee. Purify me, enlighten me, sanctify me, transform me into thee, that I may be naught but love for my God. Second point. The furnace of the sacred heart of Jesus radiates love to all beings. The august heart of Jesus is a furnace of love which spreads its fiery flames in all directions, in heaven, on earth, and throughout the whole universe. Its fiery flames would have consumed the hearts of the seraphim and would have enkindled all the hearts of earth if the terrible chill of sin had not set in. Those divine fires transform all the hearts of heavenly lovers into so many furnaces of love for him, who is all love for them. All creatures on earth even those which are senseless, inanimate, and irrational, feel the effects of the incredible goodness of that magnificent heart. Since he loves all things that are and hates nothing that he has made, sin being the only thing that he did not make, the only object of his hatred. For thou lovest all things that are, and hatest none of the things which thou hast made. For thou didst not appoint or make anything hating it. From the Book of Wisdom, chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus has an extraordinary love for men, as well as for the good of the wicked, for his friends as for his enemies, for whom he has such intense charity that even the overwhelming torments and floods of their innumerable sins are not able to extinguish it. Many waters cannot quench charity, neither can the floods drown it. If a man should give all the substance of his house for love, he shall despise it as nothing. And that is from Canticles chapter 8. Verse 7. Not a moment elapses that he does not grant them manifold natural and supernatural favors, corporal and spiritual, even while they are offending him and dishonoring him by their misdeeds. 
The divine fires of the precious heart of the Son of God reach even into hell, to the devils and the damned, preserving their being, life, and the natural perfections which he gave them at creation, and not punishing them as much as they have deserved for their sins, for which his divine justice might very justly chastise them much more severely than it does. His going out is from the end of heaven, and a circuit even to the end thereof, and there is no one that can hide himself from his heat. From the book of Psalms, number 18, verse 7. O sacred fires and flames of the heart of my Savior, rush in upon my heart and the hearts of all my brethren, and kindle them into as many furnaces of love for my most loving Jesus. Third point. Intensity of the love of the sacred heart of Jesus. Imagine all the charity, all the affections, all the tender and intimate feelings of all the hearts that the omnipotent hand of God might fashion as being collected and united in one heart large enough to contain them. Would they not all be capable of forming one unimaginable furnace of love? But realize that all the fires and flames of such a furnace would not make one tiny spark of the immense love with which the infinitely loving heart of Jesus is inflamed towards you, O Christian soul. O furnace infinitely to be desired, who will grant me to be plunged into that burning fire? O mother of Jesus, O all ye angels, O all ye holy saints of Jesus, I give myself to you all and to each in particular, and I give you also all my brothers and sisters in Christ and all the inhabitants of earth, that you may cast us all into the abyss of that sacred furnace. Attended here, O vast furnace of love, a tiny straw asks most humbly, and earnestly to be plunged, buried, lost, devoured, and consumed wholly in thy sacred flames and thy holy fires forever and ever. Prayer. O fire which ever burnest and is never extinguished, O love which is ever fervent and never grows tepid, inflame me wholly that I may love thee wholly. Amen. And with that, I'm going to end this series on St. John Eude and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. There is more to the book. It goes over the mass that he created, the office, the divine office, and some other prayers. Uh, but I'll leave that for those of you who wish to, to read that section. You can find it in the PDF link in the description box. Uh, I am grateful to all of you who persevered all the way to the end of this. Uh, I am confident that you've profited greatly from it. I know I have. I know the Sacred Heart of Jesus appreciates your love for him in wanting to learn and spending this time with him in learning. Uh, I ask you, please, to keep in your prayers. I certainly need them. To please pray for the salvation of souls, especially those who are dying at this moment who will die on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. Please remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Please pass this on or, or do whatever you can to, to promote the devotion to the Sacred Heart. Uh, as it is our duty uh, to our, our fellow human beings. And we should be happy and we should be wanting to do this for love of God and for love of neighbor. But that is it for now. I wish you all a blessed, a very blessed feast day of the most sacred heart.